There is perhaps no area of your life where self-discipline has a greater impact on your future than in your work. Yet, if you're like most people, from the moment you start in the morning and throughout the day, you're surrounded by people and events that draw you away from doing the things that are most important. However, it is through doing your most important tasks that you move onward and upward quickly and dependably in your career. A group of senior executives was asked, what are the most important qualities that a person would need to be promoted in your company? Of these executives, 85% agreed that the most important qualities are 1. The ability to set priorities and work on high-value tasks and 2. The discipline to get the job done quickly and well. It seems that these two qualities are more helpful for career success than anything else a person could do. Diligent, disciplined, focused work will enable you to consistently and predictably get more done, get paid more, and get promoted faster throughout your career than the average person. Separating the relevant from the irrelevant, I've mentioned the Pareto Principle, the 80-20 rule, several times in this book, and it applies again here. Fully 80% of the value of what you accomplish will come from 20% of the things you do. Your job then is to identify those top 20% of your tasks, and then concentrate single-mindedly on doing them quickly and well. Chapter 13 discusses time management in detail. But for now, let's take a look at the flip side of good time management. Poor time management. According to Robert Half International, the average employee wastes about 50% of his or her time on non-work-related activities. 37% of work time is wasted on idle conversations on personal subjects with co-workers. Conversations that have nothing whatever to do with the job at hand. The other 13% of wasted time is consumed by coming in late or leaving early, long lunches, coffee breaks, surfing the internet, reading the newspaper, or conducting personal business during the day. Even worse, when people who waste a lot of time actually settle down and get to work, they spend too much time on low-value tasks and activities. As a result, they get very little done, which then causes them to feel that they are under continual pressure to get caught up. Unfortunately, when you waste time at work, your work does not go away. It continually builds like an avalanche. Deadlines come closer and closer. Dress mounts up. Until you finally force yourself to do the job, usually at the last minute. And then you often make expensive mistakes. Developing an excellent reputation is crucial. There's nothing that will bring you to the attention of people who can help you faster than for you to develop a reputation for hard, disciplined work every hour of every day. Average employees increase their income at only about 3% per year, which is just about the rate of inflation or cost of living increases. In other words, if you're an average employee, you're not really making any more money from year to year. Rather, you're just keeping up with your expenses. But the top 20% in most fields increase their income anywhere from 10 to 25% per year, which is also compounded year after year. The top 20% of people at work earn 80% of the money. The bottom 80% of employees have no choice but to share the 20% of the money that is left over. They must scramble for the crumbs that fall off the tables of the highly productive people in their fields. You can double your income. When I say to people in my seminars that you should set a goal to double your income in the months and years ahead, people react in different ways. Often at the break, someone will come up to me and say, You don't understand my company. There's no way that I could double my income at my current company. They simply would not pay me that amount of money. Having heard this before, I then ask them the critical question. Is there anyone at your company who earns twice as much as you do? The person that I'm talking to will always agree that yes, there are people in my company who earn two or three times as much as I do. I then make the key point. So, your company is quite willing to pay some people twice as much as they pay you. They're just not willing to pay you twice as much. Why is that? Then suddenly the light goes on, and the individual realizes that it is not the company that is not willing to pay the money. It is the individual who is not contributing enough to be worth that additional money. The responsibility is on the individual, not the company. The Law of Three helps you to prioritize. When we coach entrepreneurs, executives and business owners, we take them through an exercise designed to help them double their productivity, performance, and output within 12 months, sometimes even within 30 days. It's simple. Here's how it works. First, make a list of all the things you do in a week or a month, from the time you start work on Monday morning through to the end of the week. Write down everything, both small and large, including checking your email and returning phone calls. Then review this list and ask this key question. 
If I could only do one thing on this list all day long, which one task or activity contributes the most value to my company? As you go over your list, the correct answer will probably jump out at you. Whatever it is, put a circle around it. Then ask the second question. If I could only do two things on this list all day long, which would be the second task or activity? Review your list again and identify your second most important task in terms of contribution to your company. Finally, ask the question once more. If I could only do three things on this list all day long, what would be the third item? We call this the Law of Three. The Law of Three says that there are three primary things that you do that contribute 90% or more of your value to your company or organization. Your job is to identify those three critical tasks and then discipline yourself to do them all day long. All of your other minor tasks will be support tasks, complementary tasks, enjoyable tasks, or useless tasks. They will be little things that you've gotten into the habit of doing as a way of unconsciously avoiding the big, difficult, important tasks that can make a tremendous difference in your working career. Calculate your hourly rate. Another way for you to double your income is for you to use the hourly rate method of calculating your personal value and your time allocation. First, determine the amount that you earn each hour. You do this by dividing your annual income by the number 2000, which is roughly the number of hours that an entrepreneur or executive works each year in our society, 40 hours a week times 50 weeks a year. For example, if you earn $50,000 a year, divided by 2000, your hourly rate would be $25. If you earn $100,000 per year, divided by 2000, your hourly rate would be $50. Whatever it is, from that moment onward, resolve to do only those things that pay you your hourly rate or better. Refuse to do those things that someone else can do at a lower hourly rate than you. Do not waste your time doing things of low value or no value while your other important tasks are building up. Get on the same page about what work is most important. Once you have made a list of all the results you feel you have been hired to accomplish, and you have determined your three most important things that you do to justify your hourly rate, take your list of key activities to your boss, and have your boss organize your job based on his or her priorities. You need to do this because you must be sure. Benjamin Trigo, co-founder of the Kepner Trigo consulting firm and author of The Rational Manager, once said, The very worst use of time is to do very well what need not be done at all. Yet it is amazing how many people are working hard on tasks that are of little or no value to their bosses. No matter how well you do an unimportant task, it doesn't help you. Even worse, Working on low-value tasks keeps you from working on the most important things you could be doing. Hard work on the wrong job can actually sabotage your career. The happiest days you will have at work will be when you are working on those tasks that your boss considers to be the most important. The unhappiest days at work will be when you and your boss are at cross-purposes and not getting along, primarily because you are not completing the jobs that are most important to him and to his career. Your goal is to be paid more and promoted faster. Your goal is to become one of the most valuable and highest paid people in your field. Your job is first to make yourself valuable, and then to make yourself indispensable to your company. This requires, first and foremost, that you are always working on those tasks your boss considers most important. Work all the time you work. The key to doubling your productivity and output, and eventually your income, is to really work all the time you're at work. Simply put, when you work, work. Don't waste time, don't delay, and don't chat with co-workers or sit around drinking coffee. Don't read the newspaper or surf the internet. When you come into work in the morning, put your head down and then work all day long. The biggest time wasters in the world of work are other people who want to talk with you, distract you, delay you, and take up the time that you should be spending on high-value tasks. When a time waster approaches you and says, Do you have a minute to talk? You reply by saying, Yes, but not now. Why don't we talk at lunchtime or after work? In the meantime, I have to get this job finished. I have to get back to work. When you tell people that you're under the gun, that you have to get a task finished for your boss, they will usually leave you alone. If you do this often enough, they will develop the habit of leaving you alone and instead find someone else with whom to waste time. Keep yourself motivated and focused by talking to yourself in a positive way. Your mantra from now on should be, back to work, back to work, back to work. Whenever you find yourself slowing down on a major task, begin repeating to yourself those magic words. Back to work. Who works hardest? The secret survey. 
Imagine that an outside company is going to do a study of all the people who work in your organization. They're going to give each person a list of all the employees and ask them to rate their fellow employees in terms of who works the hardest, the second hardest, and so on. They're then going to give this list of people, organized from the hardest worker down to the laziest, to your superiors. This list is going to be used to determine who gets paid more and promoted faster than others. Now imagine this survey is already being taken, but in secret. The fact is, in any organization, everyone knows who works harder than anyone else. Everyone knows who works less, who does not pull their weight. Everyone knows. It's not a secret at all. Resolve today that if a survey like this were to be taken one year from today, you would win the contest. Resolve today that you are going to develop the reputation for being the hardest working person in your business. This will do more to help you than almost anything else. When you are surrounded by time-wasting people and in situations that waste time, it takes tremendous self-discipline to work all the time you're at work. You must constantly fight against distractions and interruptions so that you can get back to work. Success Formula When I began my career working for a large company, I was the low man on the totem pole. Everyone had been there longer than me and was ahead of me in the company pecking order. Even though I was in my early 30s, I still had no idea how to play the game or what to do to get ahead in the cutthroat corporate competition that existed. Somewhat by accident, I stumbled onto the formula that made me successful. It was very simple. Whenever my boss gave me something to do, I did it immediately. Like a dog chasing after a thrown stick, I would immediately throw myself at the task, complete it, and hurry back to my boss with the finished job. Initially he would smile and say something like, I didn't really need it done that quickly, but thank you for getting it done. I was caught up with my work. Instead of relaxing, I would go to my boss and say, I'm all caught up. I want more work to do. I want more responsibility. These words became my mantra. I want more responsibility. Again, my boss who was preoccupied with an enormous number of projects, would say something like, Okay, leave it with me, and I'll think about what else I can give you to do. Every day, like a broken record, I would go to my boss at the end of the day and say, I'm all caught up. I would like more responsibility. Bit by bit, he began to toss me tasks. He would give me a little task to do to keep me busy. Whatever it was, I would go out immediately, complete the task, and bring in the results. I would then say, I'm all caught up. I want more responsibility. Within six months, he began to see me as the go-to guy. Whenever he had something he needed done quickly, he passed by everyone else and gave it to me. He knew that whenever he asked what to do, I would do it quickly. Once my boss asked me to fly to Reno to begin development work on a property that the company was purchasing, he told me I could go sometime in the next couple of weeks. Instead, I left the next morning. I went straight to the lawyer who was handling the transaction, and then to the engineer who was in charge of the development work. I immediately sensed that something was seriously wrong with this land purchase. I didn't know what it was, but I went from person to person asking questions and gathering information. By the end of the day, just a few hours before this $2 million transaction was set to close and the money would change hands forever, I found that we were about to be sold a piece of land that had no water and was therefore undevelopable because of complex laws and limited riparian rights. The property was a worthless piece of ground that could not be developed within the next hundred years. If we had proceeded with the purchase, we would have lost $2 million. I immediately stopped the transaction, demanded that the lawyer cut me a certified check for the $250,000 deposit that was in his trust account, and flew home to my boss to tell him the story. As you can imagine, my boss was very happy with what I had done. From that day forward, I received more and more responsibilities. Within another year, I was running three divisions of the company and had a staff of 42 people in three cities. I later learned that my boss paid me more money than anyone else who ever worked for him, and he did so all on the basis of results and profitability. This is why, whenever people ask me how to succeed in business by really trying, I give them the same advice. Whatever your boss gives you to do, do it quickly and well. Then go and ask for more responsibility, and when you get it, do the job quickly and well until you get a reputation for being the person who does things fast. This will help you advance in your career more than any other reputation. Pay the price. Here is a simple three-part formula for success at work. Come in a little earlier. Work a little harder and stay a little later. 
This will move you so far ahead of your competitors that they will never catch up. Coming to work one hour earlier, before anyone else arrives, use that time to plan and organize your day and get started on your most important tasks. Make sure that whenever your boss comes to work, you are always there working before he arrives. Second, work a little harder. Don't waste time, don't chat with coworkers. Work through lunchtime so that you can get on top and stay on top of your main tasks and responsibilities. Third, work one hour later than your coworkers. If they leave at five o'clock, you leave at six. Use that extra time to complete your important tasks and get yourself organized for the following day. When you come in one hour earlier, work through lunch and work one hour later, you add three full productive hours to your day because there are no interruptions when you work during these time periods. You'll actually accomplish two or three times as much as you would during your other work hours, when you're constantly interrupted by other people and telephone calls. In fact, you can double or even triple your productivity, performance and output by simply adding these three hours to your workday. The good news is that by coming in earlier and leaving later, you don't lose anything. You merely avoid the traffic tie-ups and slowdowns that most people suffer through on their ways to and from work. Use the 40 plus formula. This formula says that you can tell where you're going to be five years from now by looking at the number of hours that you put in today in excess of 40 hours per week. If all you do is put in the regular 40 hours that everyone else puts in, all you will do is survive. Your annual increases will be three or four percent. You will have a job, but your income increases will go up at the same rate as everyone else. It is when you begin to put in more than 40 hours that you give yourself an advantage over most of the other people in your company and your business. Make it a habit to do more than what you are paid for. Discipline yourself to put in more than you take out. Every hour that you work over 40 hours a week is an investment in your future success. The highest paid people in America, in every field, work 50 to 60 hours per week. The average self-made millionaire works 59 hours per week. This is equal to 5 12-hour days or 6 10-hour days. Most successful people at the beginning of their careers work 6 days a week, sometimes 7. Moreover, they worked all the time they were at work. They didn't waste time. They realized that in order to reap a great harvest later in their career, they sowed a lot of seeds in the springtime of their career. Finally, to succeed at work, you need to discipline yourself to look the part. Remember, birds of a feather flock together. When it comes to a presentation, this means that people like to promote others who look like them. Your bosses are very sensitive to the appearance of their staff. They like to promote people who they are proud to introduce to their friends and colleagues. Be sure that you dress and groom in such a way that your boss will be proud to take you out for lunch and introduce you to others as a representative of his or her company. Each morning before you go to work, look in the mirror and ask yourself, Do I look like one of the top people in my field? If you don't, go back and change, and keep changing until you look like one of the top people in your business. Learn how to dress for success. Read books and articles, or ask others for advice. Look at the most successful people in your business and dress the way they do. Dress for the job two levels above your current job. Remember that fully 95% of the first impression you make on other people will be determined by your dress and grooming. Make sure that the first impression, and then the second and third impressions, are consistent with the message you want to send. Many people work their entire lives without realizing that by putting forward a little extra effort, working a little harder, and focusing on higher value tasks, they can become one of the most valuable people in their organizations. When you discipline yourself to continually increase the value of your contribution to your company, you put your career on the fast track and virtually guarantee yourself a wonderful future. How come there's such a difference between those who can reach incredible heights and those who haven't yet found answers for their light, their health, and their future? We just have to ponder that and let it give us a note of seriousness. It's serious whether you win or lose whether you succeed or fail, whether you've carved out a good future for yourself or not. Here's how to really capitalize on this year. Number one, life is serious. We call it life or death. Next, make this your best year ever. Have a piece of the 400 million and see what you can do to touch as many people as possible. Number two, get smart. That's what these journals are for. That's what pen and paper are for. That's what taking notes is for. See if you can increase your ability to comprehend ideas, information that can be life transforming. Don't miss the opportunity to learn. Take a good key phrase home and use it in your training. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be casual in learning. Develop a whole new intensity for the 90s so you're not going to miss the information, the stories, or the details. 
Here's a couple of parts to it. First, your own personal experience. If you've had a bad week, sit down and ponder it for a while. Study it. See if you can pick up some ideas from a poor week and then make a better week. Learn from your own experiences. One way to learn to do it right is to do it wrong. But don't let it take too long. If you've done it wrong for a year, that's long enough. Learn from your own experience. The call didn't go well. Guess what? They made another call. What else could we do to make it better? How could we possibly improve? This is called the possibility for life change, and it starts with education. Don't be lazy in learning. Don't be lazy in picking up ideas. Don't be lazy in learning from your own experience. That's why you've heard from some people who have shared their testimonials here and given you some of their ideas and ways and means of taking this product to the marketplace, making it work for you. We've devoted most of our time to that, and well we should. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of change. So, education, get smart. Don't miss the training class. You might say, well, I've already been to one of those classes, I've already heard it. I've got a good phrase for you to take home. That's no sign you've got it. Just because you've listened to those millionaire tapes one time, no sign you've got it. I'm asking you to listen to them over and over and over. I'm asking you to dedicate yourself to a new level of learning in 1992. When I traveled with Mark Hughes in 1992, he had his book open, reading, studying the lives of successful people and lives of despicable people. You know, study, learn, grow, change, develop. Never let it be said you didn't learn, right? If you want to solve your problems, you've got to learn. If you want to take advantage of an opportunity, you've got to learn. We can't come here and just give you the marketing plan, give you the product, send you home. We've got to stay for a while, learn, stay for a while, right? Put on those cassettes and stay for a while. We asked you to come here for a couple of days and stay for a while, do some learning, take it back home. So, number two to have your best year ever, a good piece of that 400 million, make your dreams come true. Number one, get serious. Number two, get smart. Develop your own personal philosophy. Your philosophy majorly determines how your life works out. Each person's philosophy is like the set of the sail. The same wind blows on a soil. The difference is where we arrive at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, is not the wind that blows, and the wind is blowing around the world. The world is in solution. Things are changing. The walls have come down. All kinds of things are happening in Russia today. The winds are blowing. But what's going to make the major difference? Each person's personal philosophy. That sets a better sail. So, don't ask for a more favorable wind. That's like wishing for something that's not going to occur. Don't ask for better seed and soil. All you've got is what's available. Don't curse what you've got on this planet. All we've got is the seed that's here, the soil that's here, the miracle of life that's here, the opportunity that's here, the seasons that are here. That's all we've got. Wherever you've come from in your country, the economy you've got, that's all you've got. In America, our economy, that's all we've got. The government, that's all we've got. The marketplace, that's all we've got. Whatever you do, don't criticize. The key is to set a better sail and turn what you've got into the miracle of your future. Don't wish it was easier. Wish you were better. Don't wish for less problems. Wish for more skills. That's the reason for coming here, spending a couple of days of intense effort, taking notes, rolling up your sleeves, going to work, committing yourself to learning so that you can get smarter for the days ahead. Develop your philosophy. Herbalife's philosophy has carried it now these 12 years to extraordinary heights. Those who do the work get the pay. A philosophy that commits itself to having the finest, no matter what it costs. That kind of pull-up. I'm asking you to develop your own personal philosophy. Get your business philosophy going. Get your financial plan going. Don't violate the conclusion of your own philosophy by not executing and taking action. Get smart. Here's number three. Get going. As smart as you might become after these two days, as many ideas as you take away from here, they're truly like seeds to be planted in the soil. You've got to get going. You've got to take action. The discipline is the miracle process. And here's how to get the miracle of your future going. As far as discipline is concerned, number one, you might go home and set a whole new pace for yourself. We call it cleaning up neglect. Should walk around the block, 
could walk around the block for your good health? Don't walk around the block, see? You're on the wrong track. Should read? Could read? Don't read on the wrong track. Should call? Could call? Don't call on the wrong track. Could change? Should change? Don't change. You're on the wrong track. Letters you haven't written. Conversations you haven't had with your family. Somebody you should sit down with when you get back home. Get that job done. Don't let neglect destroy your days, destroy your life, and destroy your future. Go back and do what you can, undoing all that neglect. Second, take immediate action. Could is an enemy. Will is a friend. If you start the day with good intentions and you can say, I will, you've got the magic key. You might say, well, I don't think I can do it. Let me share with you about not being able to do it. Let me share with you about the impossible. A lot of things are impossible. But I'm telling you, when you put some energy behind it and some effort behind it, get some help behind it, go to work on it, a lot of things that are impossible just become possible. The magic of those possibilities is available to us all. So number three, get going. Put yourself into action. Do what you can. Don't let yourself slip. Don't become a victim of neglect. Don't let it destroy the possibilities that are all here for you. Don't let the neglect destroy the progress you could make and the changes you could make in your life. Your family, your future. Don't let neglect rob you. Go home and clean up the neglect. Get in action. So, that's what I would like to share with you for these couple of days. It's been a great pleasure for me to be here. You've got to seize it with your own two hands and take advantage. Read the books, study the tapes, go back through your notes. Get ready to cash in on the spring. And now, there's a sense of urgency here. Here's why. Spring doesn't last that long. To be able to say, I just got back, doesn't last that long. It's called the springtime of opportunity. Postpone a few things in the springtime, get the job done. Set aside a few things in the springtime, get the job done. Report. I was raised in Idaho farm country. What if you asked a farmer to go bowling in the spring? What would he probably say? He would say, you're insane. You can go bowling in the winter when you can't plant the crop. You can't go bowling in the spring. You've only got a certain piece of time, and you've got to get it done in that certain window of opportunity. And that's what we've got here. A window of opportunity. Let's take advantage of it. It's called seizing the spring. And there's also an urgency here. How many springs have you got in a lifetime? Not very many. Life is brief. At the longest the Beatles wrote, life is very short. And for John Lennon it was extra short. For Michael Landon it was extra short. But it is short. There's an urgency here. Don't waste your springs. Don't just let them pass, hoping the time will pass. Take advantage. Last year, it was in Seize the Moment. And I'm asking you, this season, to seize the spring opportunity. You've got a new organization going. Seize the spring. You've got a new distributor going. Seize the spring. You've got a new life situation going. Seize the spring. Take advantage of it. Don't let it pass without giving it the best of your two hands and your attention. First, learn how to handle the winter. Second, take advantage of the spring. Number three. In the summer, learn to nourish and protect. We've got some major challenges now come summertime. One is to nourish our values. Take care of them. Feed them. Don't let them go hungry. Then, here's something else. We've got to defend ourselves against the enemies. Summertime is a unique time. It's a time of opportunity. It's also a time of challenge. But what else is new? It's what life has called for the last six and a half thousand years. It reads like this. Opportunity mixed with difficulty. We've got a chance to grow like never before. But I'm telling you, there are going to be many enemies that are going to try to prevent us. As soon as you plant the garden, the busy bugs and the noxious weeds are out to take it. And you've got to learn not only to nourish your values, you've got to learn to do battle with your enemies. Whatever threatens you, I'm asking you to threaten it back. Take care of your responsibility, but don't take anything off anybody. Somebody wants to destroy your chances for a good future by their negative talk, negative thinking, putting it all down. I'm telling you, walk away if you have to walk away. Whatever threatens you, threaten it back. Now some of our enemies are on the outside. But here's the most important thing to understand. Some of our enemies are on the inside. Let me give you a quick list. Indifference. You've got to do battle with your own indifference. Boy, it's easy to coast. 
especially if you've accomplished something extraordinary. Now, if somebody says, I've got to relax, here's the key. Not too long. The weeds will take over your plant if you rest too long. Don't rest too long. Don't rest too long. Indecision. You've got to make those decisions. The ones that don't turn out to be good give you experience to make better decisions. Don't let much time go by without making some decisions. The ones that you can make quickly, make them quickly. The ones that take time, take your time. But get those decisions made. Don't let indecision be an enemy. Doubt. Sure, there's doubts on the outside. People doubt that America is going to make it. People doubt that Europe's going to make it. People doubt that Russia is going to make it. Poland, Czechoslovakia. They doubt the whole world is going to make it. But I'm asking you not to pick up all those doubts. I'm asking you to have some faith, have some courage, and believe. Drive your doubts into a small corner. Don't let them loose like a mad dog. Drive them into a small corner. Don't doubt the future. Don't doubt the possibilities. Don't doubt the extraordinary gifts that your distributors bring to your organization. Don't doubt that. Here's the most important one of all. Don't doubt yourself. If I've got miracle working power to change my life, so do you. If I've got the ability to change, so do you. If I've got the ability to read, so do you. If I can discover, so can you. If I can grow, you can grow. If I can develop, you can develop. If I can get an invitation like I got six years ago to help take something around the world, so can you. I can stand on this platform, Idaho farm boy, raised in obscurity. So can you. If the millionaire team can do it, president's team can do it, walk off with the diamonds, the trophies, so can you. I'm asking you, don't sell yourself short. We haven't sold you short. That's why Mark, Larry, Dr. Katzen and I have decided to invest the big share of our lives in these four days being with all of you. If we didn't think you were worth it, we wouldn't have shown up. We don't need to collect another meeting. We don't need to walk on another stage. We don't need to get up early like we do. We don't need it, except for the challenge and the opportunity to invest in this many people's lives. Who wouldn't get up early to have a chance to work miracles and invest in this many people's lives and help turn the world upside down for better nutrition? Called Herbalife. Here's the next one. Worry. I'm asking you to drive worry into a small corner. You've got to worry about something. All this negative stuff certainly serves some purpose. But the key is for you to be the master, not the servant. If it's two in the morning and your daughter's not home yet, best you worry. In New York City, if you step off the curb and one of those yellow taxis is coming, best you worry. But here's what I'm asking you to do. You be the master of worry. Drive it into a small corner. Don't let it loose. And I'm asking you to go home with some new faith and some new courage. Don't worry. Drive it into a small corner. We've all got concerns, and sometimes we all wonder, and sometimes there's a little crack of doubt, but here's the key. Keep it small. Don't let it loose. Don't let it destroy your dreams. Don't let it kill your faith. Don't let it ruin your life. Here's the next one. Over caution. Some people never start anything. They wait. They've got to make sure there are no mistakes. No, don't make a mistake. Don't start a business that you know has got to be closed in six months. But here's what else is important. Don't wait until you can make no mistakes. Don't wait until you're sure that you'll succeed. Don't wait until all the lights are green before you leave home. If you wait for that, you'll never leave home. The lights are never all green. Someone once said, you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. That's over caution. You've got to be willing to take a chance. You've got to be willing to put your guts on the line. You've got to be willing to take a risk. Drive caution into a small corner. Don't let it loose. It can be beneficial, but it can also be destructive. And I'm asking you, don't let it destroy your chances for greatness. Don't let it destroy your chances for success. And some people just don't have any appetite for risk. Don't get to be 80 years old and find out you could have been a risk taker. You could have had your own business. You could have been independent. You could have been free. You could have been wealthy. You could have had influence and power. Don't sell yourself short. Don't cheat yourself out of the blessings and the miracles of life that you deserve. That's over caution. Here's the last one. Pessimism. It's a real challenge. And sometimes it sounds like wisdom. Someone says, well, you've got to be careful. You've got to be wise. 
You've got to be cautious. You've got to look for the downside. All that's good advice. But here's what else is good advice. You've got to believe in tomorrow. You've got to believe in the possibilities. You've got to believe that every life is precious. You've got to believe that every life is worth saving. You've got to believe that every life is worth serving. You've got to believe that every life is worth helping. Don't be pessimistic about the future. We can change the future. We can alter the course of history. And I'm asking you to be a part of it. Here's what else is important. Drive your philosophy into a small corner. Be the master, not the servant. Use it as a tool, not as a crutch. That's a major challenge. Learning how to handle the winters, take advantage of the springs, nourish and protect in the summers, and prepare for the harvest. If you'll start working on your philosophy, getting that in good order, then it'll start to order your days. It'll start to order your values. It'll start to order your life. And your life will really start to take a major change. We call that progress. And progress is not only possible, progress is essential. You see, here's what we teach the kids. Take advantage of the spring. Get ready for the summer. Plant in the spring, and you'll have in the fall. If you plant in the spring, you'll have in the fall. If you wait until the fall, forget it. It's too late. It's too late to plant in the fall. It's too late to speculate in the fall. Now, you can speculate any old way you want to, but that's not going to alter the fall. The only thing that's going to alter the fall are the risks you take in the spring. If you plant in the spring, you'll have in the fall. If you plant your values in the spring, you'll have the fall. If you make a few investments in the spring, you'll have in the fall. If you give some extra time in the spring, you'll have in the fall. And if you'll do it now, if you'll get excited now, if you'll change your philosophy now, if you'll go to work on yourself and develop the skills now, then you'll have in the fall. And I'm telling you, the fall will be yours. The spring and the fall will be yours. You can have a brand new life. You can have a new beginning. You can have a new life story. You can have a whole new deal, your own miracle. That's what we've got available. And all you've got to do is take advantage of the spring. Imagine standing at the threshold of your dreams, gazing into the horizon where the future stretches out vast and unfathomable. Then, in this moment, you're faced with a choice. A choice to venture into the unknown that promises no safety nets, but the potential for unparalleled growth and achievement. This is the essence of embracing the belief that you can do what others can't. Let me share with you a story that exemplifies this belief. A narrative not just of triumph, but of transformation. This tale is about a person much like anyone here with dreams that seem too big, too unattainable. This individual dared to envision a future where they achieved what others deemed impossible. Our protagonist, let's call him Alex, was once confined to a life of predictability. From a young age, Alex was told what was realistic and achievable. Stay within the lines. They said, choose a practical path. But deep down, Alex harbored a vision so bold, so beyond the ordinary, that it became a flicker of light in the darkness of conformity. Alex's dream was not merely to succeed in their chosen field, but to revolutionize it, to not just play the game, but to change it entirely. This was a path fraught with skepticism, years of discouragement from mentors, and the ever-looming shadow of failure, yet, Alex persisted, fueled by a belief in their vision, and a resolve that was unbreakable. The journey was anything but smooth. There were moments of doubt, instances where the end seemed nowhere in sight, where every step forward was met with two steps back. It was during these times that Alex's belief was put to the test. Why continue? Some asked. It's never been done before, they pointed out. But it was precisely because it had never been done before that Alex chose to persevere, drawing inspiration from those who had dared to dream big before them. Alex leaned into their unique strengths, their unwavering passion, and an unyielding work ethic. They sought knowledge relentlessly, understanding that the foundation of unprecedented success was built on continuous learning and adaptation. Then, after years of dedication, after countless sacrifices and unwavering belief in their vision, Alex achieved what once seemed an impossible feat. They not only succeeded in their field, but also set a new benchmark for excellence, for innovation, for what was possible. They did what others couldn't because they dared to believe they could. This story, this journey of Alex, serves as a powerful reminder to all of us. It echoes the truth that within each of us lies the potential to achieve the extraordinary, to transcend the limits set by others, 
to forge our path where none existed. It is a testament to the power of belief, the resilience of the human spirit, and the unassailable truth that you can do what others can't. Today, as you stand on the brink of your own journey, remember Alex's story. Embrace your unique vision, nurture your belief in the impossible, and step into the vastness of your potential. For in doing so, you too will discover that you can achieve what others deem impossible. You can do what others can't. As we stride forward from the foundation laid by those who dared to venture beyond the ordinary, we come to a pivotal cornerstone of any journey toward achieving what others deem impossible. The power of belief in yourself. This belief, this unwavering confidence in your own capabilities, is not just a tool. It's the very engine that propels you towards realms of success that others might only dream of. Consider the story of a person, we'll call them Jordan, who stood at the crossroads of life, much like you and me. Jordan was faced with an opportunity that seemed so far out of reach it might as well have been on the moon. Everyone around Jordan said it couldn't be done, that it was a fool's errand. Yet within Jordan burned a belief so strong that no amount of doubt could extinguish it. Jordan believed with every fiber of their being that they could and would achieve their seemingly impossible goal. This belief wasn't born overnight. It was cultivated through years of small victories and colossal failures, each teaching Jordan a valuable lesson about the power of self-belief. When Jordan was knocked down, they didn't see a defeat. They saw an opportunity to rise stronger. When doors were slammed shut, Jordan found windows to open. It was this relentless belief in themselves that eventually led Jordan to achieve what no one thought possible, turning skeptics into believers. But how does one build such belief in themselves? It begins with understanding that belief is a choice. You choose to believe in your ability to succeed even when evidence to the contrary stares you in the face. It's about focusing on your strengths, not your weaknesses. It's about embracing challenges as steps on the ladder to your success, not as insurmountable walls blocking your path. One actionable device for building self-belief is to practice positive self-talk. Every morning, look yourself in the mirror and affirm your capabilities. I am capable. I am resilient. I can do what others can't. These aren't just words. They're seeds of belief that you plant in the garden of your mind, which, with consistent care, will grow into unshakable confidence. Another strategy is to set and achieve small goals. Success breeds success. By setting small achievable goals and accomplishing them, you build a track record of success that bolsters your belief in your ability to tackle bigger challenges. Visualization is a powerful tool for building self-belief. Spend time each day visualizing yourself achieving your goals. See it in vivid detail, the triumph, the celebration, the sense of accomplishment. This mental rehearsal primes your brain to navigate the path to success, making the achievement of your goals feel not just possible, but inevitable. Surround yourself with believers. Find mentors, friends, and colleagues who believe in you and your vision. Their faith in you will bolster your own belief in yourself, especially during times when your confidence wavers. Remember that the belief in yourself is the single most powerful weapon in your arsenal. As you embark on the journey to do what others can't, it's the belief that turns the impossible into the possible, that transforms dreams into reality. So hold on to that belief, nurture it, and let it guide you to heights you once thought unreachable. For in the end, it is not just about achieving what others can't, it's about becoming the person you were always meant to be. The foundation of believing in ourselves naturally progresses to the next step in our quest for greatness. Setting goals beyond the ordinary. It is here, in daring to dream bigger and bolder than ever before, that the true magic of achievement begins to unfold. Imagine standing at the edge of a vast ocean, your eyes set not on the horizon, but on the unseen lands beyond it. This is the essence of setting high, unconventional goals. It's not just about aiming for what is known and within reach, but rather reaching for what lies beyond our current grasp, for what seems impossible. It's about turning the improbable into the achievable. The significance of setting such audacious goals cannot be overstated. High goals act as beacons, guiding us through the fog of the mundane and the ordinary. They challenge us, push us, and ultimately transform us. They force us out of our comfort zones and into the realm of extraordinary achievement. But how does one set these extraordinary goals? It begins with a shift in mindset. You must first believe that no dream is too big, no goal too daring. From there, 
It's about envisioning what truly excites you, what ignites a fire within your soul. It's about asking yourself, what would I dare to achieve if I knew I could not fail? This question alone has the power to propel you into realms of possibility that were previously unimagined. Now let us draw inspiration from the stories of those who dared to dream big and saw their dreams come to fruition. Consider the tale of a young inventor who, in the face of skepticism, dreamed of making the power of computing accessible to everyone. At a time when computers were the preserve of corporations and universities, this dream seemed audacious, to say the least. Yet through unwavering belief in his vision and relentless pursuit of his goals, he transformed the landscape of technology and communication. His name is known worldwide, not just as a pioneer, but as a visionary who changed how we live, work, and connect. Another story is of a runner once deemed too frail to compete at the highest levels. Instead of accepting this as her fate, she set her sights on the most grueling of athletic challenges, the marathon. Her goal was not just to compete, but to triumph. Through years of rigorous training, battling injury, and overcoming doubt, she not only finished the race but shattered records, inspiring countless others to believe in the impossible. So how do you embark on this journey of setting and achieving extraordinary goals? Start by writing down your dreams, no matter how far-fetched they may seem. Visualize achieving these dreams, feel the success, the triumph, and the fulfillment. Break down your ultimate goal into smaller, actionable steps and tackle each one with determination and resilience. And remember, every step forward, no matter how small, is a step closer to turning your extraordinary dreams into reality. Navigating the path toward achieving what others deem impossible, we find ourselves at a crucial juncture. The role of persistence and resilience. This stretch of our journey might well be considered the backbone of any quest for extraordinary success. It's here, in the gritty determination to press on despite setbacks, that dreams are either made or lost. Persistence is not just a desirable trait. It's absolutely crucial. It's the relentless engine that powers us through the inevitable storms and challenges that life throws in our path. Without persistence, even the most brilliant of plans and the most inspiring of goals will wither on the vine, unfulfilled and forgotten. But let's delve deeper into this concept with a story that brings it to life. Imagine a scientist working in obscurity, fueled by a vision that others dismissed as fantasy. Day after day, year after year, faced with failure, skepticism, and rejection, they persisted. Their work, once on the fringes of credibility, eventually led to a breakthrough that transformed the world. This is not just a tale of success. It's a testament to the power of persistence. It's the story of countless innovators, from the Wright brothers to Marie Curie, whose unwavering commitment to their vision changed the course of history. So how do we cultivate this indomitable spirit of persistence and resilience? It starts with a mindset, a belief in the value of our dreams and the worth of our efforts. It's about embracing failure not as a sign to give up, but as a stepping stone, an indispensable part of the journey to success. Every setback, every obstacle offers lessons that sharpen our focus and strengthen our resolve. Here's actionable advice for developing resilience. Start by setting clear, meaningful goals. Break them down into actionable steps and celebrate every small victory along the way. Let each success fuel your drive to persist. When faced with setbacks, take a moment to regroup, to learn from the experience, and then adjust your strategy and move forward. Remember, Resilience is not about never falling. It's about how quickly and how often you're willing to get back up. Surround yourself with stories of those who overcome adversity. Let their journeys inspire you and remind you that the path to success is rarely a straight line. More importantly, build a support network of mentors, colleagues and friends who believe in your vision and encourage your persistence. Consider the case of a runner who, after numerous failed attempts at qualifying for the Olympics, could have succumbed to despair. Instead, they doubled down on their training, refined their techniques, and sought the advice of those who had walked the path before them. Their persistence paid off, not just in finally achieving their Olympic dream, but in setting a new world record. Let's reflect on this truth. The journey toward achieving what others can't is paved with persistence and resilience. These are the qualities that will carry you over the rough patches and propel you to heights you once thought unreachable. So embrace the challenges, learn from every setback, and never lose sight of your goals. Remember, it's your persistence in the face of adversity, your resilience when confronted with failure, 
that will define your journey and ultimately your success. Our quest to achieve what others deem impossible brings us to the understanding and leveraging of our unique strengths and abilities. Each of us is endowed with a set of talents and capabilities distinct to ourselves, our own superpowers if you will. Recognizing and harnessing these innate gifts is akin to finding the key that unlocks the door to our potential, propelling us toward accomplishments that may seem out of reach to others. The journey to leveraging these unique strengths begins with a deep dive into self-awareness. It's about taking a step back to reflect on those moments when you felt most alive, most energized. What were you doing? Which tasks do you find both effortless and enjoyable? These questions guide you toward uncovering your natural talents. It's also about seeking feedback from those around you, as often others can see the brilliance in us that we might overlook. Now let me share the story of someone who harnessed their unique strength to achieve the extraordinary. Imagine a musician, not just any musician, but one born with a rare ability to hear and recreate complex compositions after a single listening. This musician could have followed a conventional path, but instead, they chose to leverage this unique ability to create a new genre of music, blending classical techniques with modern sounds. Their journey wasn't easy filled with naysayers and traditionalists who couldn't see the vision. Yet, by staying true to their unique strength, they not only achieved international fame but also transformed the landscape of music. Another example is a young entrepreneur with a remarkable knack for understanding the digital world. In an age where technology was rapidly evolving, they saw opportunities where others saw challenges. While their peers were focused on traditional business models, this entrepreneur leveraged their deep understanding of digital platforms to create a revolutionary online marketplace. It was their unique strength, a profound comprehension of the digital age, that enabled them to see the potential for such a platform, ultimately changing the way we buy and sell goods today. So how can you start leveraging your unique strengths and abilities? Begin by committing to a path of continual learning and growth. Dive into areas that align with your natural talents, seeking knowledge and skills that will amplify your abilities. Embrace challenges as opportunities to test and refine your strengths, pushing the boundaries of what you're capable of. Cultivate an environment that supports your unique talents, surrounding yourself with mentors, collaborators, and networks that encourage your growth and provide platforms for your strengths to shine. Remember, leveraging your unique strengths is not a solo journey, but a collaborative endeavor that thrives on mutual support and shared vision, woven with threads of triumphs and setbacks. It is often the patches of failure that add the most vibrant colors to our story. Understanding this, let's explore how failures and setbacks are not just mere obstacles in our path, but are in fact the very stepping stones to success. Imagine embarking on a journey, your heart set on a distant shimmering goal. Along the way, you encounter valleys of defeat and mountains of challenge. It's in these moments, in the heart of setbacks, that the seeds of greatness are sown. For it is not our successes that shape us most profoundly, but our failures. They are our greatest teachers, offering lessons of resilience, adaptability, and perseverance. For example, consider the story of an inventor whose early work was met with ridicule and rejection. Each failure, rather than dampening his spirit, only added fuel to his fire. With each setback, he learned, adapted, and pressed on, his resolve stealing with every fall. His name is now synonymous with innovation and success, a testament to the transformative power of embracing failure as a guide. How then do we learn from these experiences? The first step is to reframe our perspective on failure. Instead of viewing it as a symbol of defeat, we see it as a catalyst for growth, a puzzle to be solved. This shift in mindset opens us to the invaluable insights hidden within each setback. Moreover, it's crucial to develop a practice of reflective learning. After each setback, take a moment to step back and analyze. Ask yourself what worked, what didn't, and what can be done differently next time. This process of reflection turns each failure into a lesson, a step closer to your ultimate goal. History is replete with individuals who have harnessed their failures as lessons to achieve greatness. Consider the entrepreneur whose first venture crumbled, but who went on to build an empire by applying the hard-earned lessons from that initial failure or the artist whose early work was dismissed, only to use the criticism to refine their craft, eventually gaining worldwide acclaim. These stories underscore a universal truth. 
Our greatest breakthroughs often follow our most challenging setbacks. In embracing failures and setbacks as opportunities for learning, we unlock a powerful tool for personal and professional development. It demands courage, yes, and an unwavering belief in our ability to grow from adversity. But the rewards are boundless, leading us to achievements that once seemed beyond our reach. At the threshold of achieving what seems to be impossible, it is imperative to arm ourselves with practical strategies and habits that transform lofty dreams into tangible realities. Let's delve into actionable strategies that serve as your compass and roadmap on this journey of transcending the ordinary. First and foremost, the cornerstone of turning the impossible into the possible is crafting a detailed action plan. This is not merely about listing goals. It's about breaking down each goal into actionable steps, complete with deadlines and specific outcomes. Imagine setting sail across the vast ocean without a map or compass. That's akin to pursuing your dreams without a clear plan. Your action plan serves as your navigation system, guiding you through the choppy waters of challenges and steering you toward your destination. Time management then becomes your steadfast ally in this journey. It's about prioritizing tasks based on their significance and urgency, ensuring that every day you're inching closer to your goal. Picture a sculptor meticulously chipping away at a block of marble, each strike of the chisel deliberate and purposeful, gradually revealing the masterpiece within. Similarly, effective time management allows you to carve out your path to success one well-planned day at a time. Prioritization is the skill that enables you to distinguish between what is merely urgent and what is truly important. It's about saying no to myriad distractions that vie for your attention and saying yes to focused efforts that contribute to your overarching goals. Consider the story of an athlete training for the Olympics, their eyes set on gold. Every day, they must prioritize their training nutrition and rest, knowing that each decision brings them a step closer to the podium. This relentless focus and prioritization are what separate the champions from the contenders. To embody these strategies, let us draw inspiration from those who have traversed this path before. Take the tale of an entrepreneur who dreamt of revolutionizing an industry. Faced with skepticism and countless setbacks, they remained unwavering in their pursuit. By meticulously planning each step, managing their time like a precious resource, and prioritizing actions that aligned with their vision. They transformed their fledgling idea into a paradigm-shifting enterprise. Their journey underscores the power of resilience, strategic planning, and the relentless pursuit. Embracing a mindset of continuous learning and adaptation is crucial. The landscape of our endeavors is ever-changing, and agility and thought and action enables us to navigate unforeseen challenges. It's about being prepared to pivot to learn from each setback, and to view each failure as a stepping stone rather than a stumbling block. At the heart of our discourse lies the unwavering belief in oneself, a belief so profound that it becomes the bedrock upon which all aspirations are built. This belief, coupled with the courage to set goals that stretch the imagination and challenge the status quo, creates a foundation for achievement that knows no bounds. We've also recognized that the journey towards these lofty aspirations is punctuated with challenges, setbacks, and failures. Yet it is precisely these moments that test our resolve, shape our character, and forge our path to greatness. Persistence and resilience emerge as the beacons that guide us through these trials, reminding us that every setback is a setup for a comeback, that every failure brings with it the seeds of success. Moreover, we've delved into the power of our unique strengths and abilities our personal arsenal of talents that when fully harnessed enable us to leave an indelible mark on the world. It's through leveraging these innate gifts that we carve out our niche, make our contribution, and achieve what others can't. As we stand at the precipice of action, let this be a moment of commitment. A commitment not just to the dreams and goals we've set, but to the relentless pursuit of them. Let us step forward with a resolve that is unshakable, with a determination that is unwavering, and with a focus that is laser sharp. The path ahead may be fraught with challenges, but it is also replete with opportunities, opportunities to grow, to excel, and to achieve. So I urge you with every ounce of conviction to commit to your journey with all your heart and soul. Embrace the uncertainty, navigate the challenges, and persist through the setbacks. For it is in the crucible of adversity that greatness is forged. Let this be the mantra that guides you. I possess within me the power, the perseverance and the passion to transform my dreams into reality. Remember, the only limits that exist are those we impose upon ourselves. 
Break free from these self-imposed shackles and soar toward your destiny with confidence and courage. The journey ahead is yours to take, and the story yet to be written is yours to write. Let it be a story of triumph, a narrative of resilience, and a testament to the indomitable human spirit. For in the end, it is not just about achieving what others can't. It's about becoming the very best version of yourself in the process. When I was 21, I was broken, living in a small one-room apartment in the middle of a very cold winter. I was working on a construction job during the day and couldn't afford to go out of my apartment in the evenings where at least it was warm. So, I had a lot of time to think. One night, as I sat at my small kitchen table, I had a great flash of awareness that changed my life. I suddenly realized that everything that happened to me for the rest of my life was going to be up to me. No one else was ever going to help me. No one was coming to the rescue. I was thousands of miles from home, where I'd grown up, and had no intentions of going back for a long time. I saw clearly at that moment that if anything in my life were going to change, it would have to begin with me. If I didn't change, nothing else would change. I was responsible. I still remember that moment. It was like a first parachute jump. It was both scary and exhilarating. There I was, standing on the edge of life, and I decided to jump. From that moment onward, I accepted that I was in charge of my life. I knew that if I wanted things to be different, I would have to be different. Everything was up to me. Sadly enough, most people never do this. I've met countless men and women in their 40s and 50s who are still grumbling and complaining about earlier unhappy experiences and still blaming their problems on other people and circumstances. The greatest enemies of success and happiness are negative emotions of all kinds. It is negative emotions that hold you down, tire you out, and take away all your joy in life. One of your most important goals, if you want to be truly happy and successful, is to free yourself from negative emotions. Fortunately, this can be done if you learn how. The negative emotions of fear, self-pity, envy, jealousy, feelings of inferiority, and ultimately, anger, are mostly caused by four factors. Once you identify and remove these factors from your thinking, your negative emotions stop automatically. The first of the four root causes of negative emotions is justification. You can only be negative as long as you can justify to yourself and others that you are entitled to be angry or upset for some reason. This is why angry people are continually explaining and elaborating on the reasons for their negative feelings. However, if you cannot justify your negativity, you cannot be angry. The second cause of negative emotions is rationalization. When you rationalize, you attempt to give a socially acceptable explanation for an otherwise socially unacceptable act. You rationalize to explain away or to put a favorable light on something that you have done that you feel bad or unhappy about. You excuse your behavior or actions by creating an explanation that sounds good, even though you know that you were an active agent in whatever occurred. You often create complex ways of putting yourself in the right by explaining that your behavior is pretty quite acceptable. All things considered, this rationalizing keeps your negative emotions alive. Rationalization and justification always require that you make someone or something else the source or cause of your problem. You cast yourself in the role of the victim and make the other person or organization into the oppressor or the bad guy. The third cause of negative emotions is an overconcern or hypersensitivity to the way that others treat you. For some people, their entire self-image is determined by the way others speak to them, talk to them, or about them, or even look at them. They have little sense of personal value or self-worth apart from the opinions of others. And if those opinions are negative for any reason, real or imagined, the victim immediately experiences anger, embarrassment, shame, feelings of inferiority, and even depression, self-pity, and despair. This explains why psychologists say that almost everything we do is to earn the respect of others, or at least to avoid losing their respect. The fourth cause of negative emotions, and the worst of all, is blaming. When I draw the negative emotions tree in my seminars, I illustrate the trunk of the tree as the propensity to blame other people for our problems. Once you cut down the trunk of the tree, all the fruits of the tree, all the other negative emotions, die immediately. Just as when you jerk the plug out of the wall that lights up the Christmas lights in the tree, all the lights go out instantly. The antidote for negative emotions of all kinds is for you to accept complete responsibility for your situation. 
The very act of accepting responsibility short circuits and cancels out any negative emotions you may be experiencing. It's only when you free yourself from negative emotions by taking complete responsibility that you can begin to set and achieve goals in every area of your life. It's only when you are free mentally and emotionally that you can begin to channel your energies and enthusiasms in a forward direction. On the other hand, once you accept total responsibility for your life, there are no limits on what you can be, do, and have. From now on, refuse to blame anyone for anything, past, present, or future. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. If you make a mistake, say, I'm sorry, and get busy rectifying the situation. To keep your mind positive, refuse to criticize, complain about, or condemn other people for anything. Every time you criticize someone else, complain about something you don't like, or condemn someone else for something they have done or not done, you trigger feelings of negativity and anger within yourself, and you are the one who suffers. Your negativity doesn't affect the other person at all. Being angry with someone is allowing him or her to control your emotions and often the entire quality of your life at long distance. This is just plain silly. Remember, positive emotions of happiness, excitement, love and enthusiasm make you feel more powerful and confident. Once you decide to accept complete responsibility for yourself, your situation, and for everything that happens to you, you can turn confidently toward your work and the affairs of your life. You become the master of your fate and the captain of your soul. In a study done in New York some years ago, researchers found that the top 3% of people in every field had a special attitude that set them apart from average performers in their industries. It was this. They viewed themselves as self-employed throughout their careers, no matter who signed their paychecks. They saw themselves as responsible for their companies, exactly as if they owned the companies personally. You should do the same. If there's anything in your life that you don't like, you are responsible. You are responsible for the consequences of your actions and your behaviors. You're where you are and what you are today because you have decided to be there. In a large sense, you are earning today exactly what you have decided to earn, no more, no less. If you're not happy with your current income, decide to earn more. Set it as a goal, make a plan, and then get busy doing what you need to do to earn what it is you want to earn. Just as the president of a corporation is responsible for the strategy and activities of that corporation, you are also responsible for the personal strategic planning of your own life and career. You are responsible for overall management, strategy setting, goals, making plans, establishing measures, and performing to get results. You are responsible for achieving certain outputs, for the quality and quantity of the work that you produce, and the results you are expected to get. As president, you are responsible for marketing strategy, for self-promotion and advancement, for creating your image and packaging yourself to be able to sell yourself for the very highest price in a competitive market. You are responsible for financial strategy, for deciding how much of your services you want to sell, and how much you want to earn, how rapidly you want to grow your income year by year, how much you want to save and invest, and how much you want to be worth when you retire. You're responsible for your people strategy and your relationships, both at home and at work. One piece of advice I give my students is to choose your boss with care. Your choice of a boss is going to have a major impact on how much you earn, how fast you get ahead, and how happy you will be at your job. By the same token, your choice of a mate and friends will have as much or more to do with your success and happiness than any other decisions you make. Finally, as president, you are in complete charge of personal research and development, personal training, and learning. It is up to you to determine the talents, skills, abilities, and core competencies you will need to earn the kind of money you want to earn in the months and years ahead. It is then your responsibility to make the investment and take the time to learn and develop these skills. Refuse to whine and complain about things that happened in the past which cannot be changed. Instead, orient yourself toward the future and think of what you want and where you're going. Above all, think about your goals. The very act of thinking about your goals makes you positive and purposeful. Once more, there's a direct relationship between the amount of responsibility you accept and the amount of control you feel. The more you say, I am responsible, the more of an internal locus of control you develop within yourself, and the more powerful and confident you feel. There's also a direct relationship between responsibility and happiness. The more responsibility you accept, the happier you become. It seems that all three, responsibility, 
control, and happiness go together. The more responsibility you accept, the greater amount of control you feel you have, the happier and more confident you become. When you feel positive and in control of your life, you will set bigger and more challenging goals for yourself. You will also have the drive and determination to achieve them. You will feel as though you hold your whole life in your own hands and that you can make it into whatever you decide. The starting point of goal setting is for you to realize that you have virtually unlimited potential to be, have or do anything you really want in life if you simply want it badly enough and are willing to work long enough and hard enough to achieve it. The second part of goal setting is for you to accept complete responsibility for your life and for everything that happens to you with no blaming and no excuses. With these two concepts clearly in mind, that you have unlimited potential on the one hand, and that you are completely responsible on the other, you are now ready to move to the next step, which is to begin designing your ideal future. Now here are three things you can do immediately to put these ideas into action. First, identify your biggest problem or source of negativity in life today. In what ways are you responsible for this situation? Second, do yourself as the president of your own company. How would you act differently if you owned 100% of the shares of your current company? Third, resolve today to stop blaming anyone else for anything and instead accept complete responsibility in every area of your life. What actions should you be taking?